it's actually been such a prolific time for investigational studies um, in myeloma, both in newly diagnosed and early relapse and relapse refractory, that we've been having really good uh, presentations at both ASH and ASCO each year. And I think ASCO this year, we had a couple really, I think, um, really important presentations. The first, I think, was um, the abstract that was presented by uh, Shaji Kumar um, from the Mayo Clinic, and he presented data on the randomized phase three trial. It was a frontline trial of uh, using um, lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone, RVD, what is considered, I think, now our standard of care, versus carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, KRD, as frontline therapy in patients who the intent was for them not to get stem cell transplantation. Um, and they enrolled over a thousand patients. And I do think that there was some bias, I think amongst all of us that potentially um, KRD was a more um, potent regimen than RVD. And, and that's why we do these phase three studies. So the results were interesting in that um, uh, patients were allowed to receive this therapy. The plant, the intent was to give, um, it, it was just over nine months, nine to 10 months of induction therapy, and then they would go on to maintenance-based therapy. Patients could get stem cells collected. Patients could go on to transplant. In fact, patients in both arms went on to transplant. But the intent was to look at the primary objectives to, was to look at progression-free survival. And in the progression-free survival of both arms, it was about the same. It turned out to be right around 34 months with no, no true uh, difference between the two arms and I think no true winner out of the, the two, um, those two arms. What I think people have been talking about through, through you know, Twitter and other, and other means post is that more patients... Um, went from RVD to transplant earlier on uh, in the RVD arm, um, that more patients came off therapy for RVD, RVD because of neuropathy. And then in the KRD arm, more patients had toxicity that um, were cardiac or cardiovascular in, in, in etiology. Um, and so I, I think um, the take-home message is, you know, with 1,000 patients tested, um, there really did not seem to be a difference between frontline RVD versus KRD. And this was actually in a, um, um, a standard risk population. It, it excluded patients that had high risk disease. Um, and that, um, you know, there, there are means in my mind to use either one of those regimens. And some patients may, we may choose to do RVD. And in some patients that we may choose to do KRD if, if we think they have some baseline neuropathy or um, you know, that we don't want to give them um, bortezomib for whatever reason, we can choose um, you know, carfilzomib-based therapy. On the other side, if they have cardiac issues, et cetera, and we choose not to give them um, carfilzomib, we can, we can happily give them RVD as the induction therapy. So I think there, we, we can use our, our clinical uh, acumen to decide you know, which one of those therapies is going to be best for the individual patient. But that was really, I thought, really uh, interesting data. The second, um, uh, the second uh, point I'll make is there were, um, there were reviews and updates on a couple of the CAR T-cell um, uh, presentations. So we had an update um, on the phase two study um, from using BB2 uh, 2121, um, and that um, was was given by Dr. Munchie from, from Boston. Um, and these are data that essentially we saw um, presented, um, we actually saw uh, online, and it was a press release that we had from BMS. And essentially the overall response rate um, in the phase two study, and this was really in the relapse refractory setting, was just over 80% um, for patients that um, uh, had received you know, more than five prior lines of therapy. It's a very, again, very heavily pretreated po population. And these are patients who received the 450 million cell dose. 
And the PFS for those patients was, was just over 11 months. Um, and so those data really, I think, support what we've seen previously in the phase one study for BB2121, that it's a very active regimen in, in these refractory patients. And we, we all have plenty of patients that um, could benefit from that therapy now, and we would use it if it was available. Um, there was no surprises. They still had uh, CRS. Over 80% of the patients had CRS. Um, but uh, the blood count suppression and the neurotoxicity, neurotoxic those were all actually acceptable side effects and known side effects, and they were manageable side effects. And so there was nothing unexpected uh, otherwise from toxicity from, from those um, data. The other thing we got a, um, um, an update on was JJ, uh, JNJ4528. Um, that was the, the Janssen study. This is a phase one study. It was presented by Dr. Berdeja, um, and it was an update um, of um, a presentation at ASH. Um, and um, essentially, they showed, again, that the overall response rate um, for this product in, in a very heavily pretreated population was 100%. And I think at this point in time, they've only had three treatment failures at the current time. And median follow-up now is in the nine to 10 month range. So that's looking very promising. Again, we don't have a PFS yet, but um, we're looking forward to seeing a PFS with that, that product. And there was also a re review from the, the JCAR H125 um, that again showed um, the um, best best responses in patients that received higher doses of, um, of the CARS, and they're actually gonna approach giving 600 million cells in the JCAR study, um, showing um, in the higher doses, response rates again, over 80%, uh, high, um, high CRS, you know, 80 to 90% CRS uh, rates, but again, majority of the CRS being grade one to two, and, and we don't have mature enough data to look at uh, PFS at, at this time. But all of those studies are continuing to show, um, I think, very impressive responses in this heavily uh, pretreated population. And any one of those therapeutics would be a welcome therapeutic right now in our myeloma um, armamentarium. I would say the other, um, the other presentation that I would uh, point to is they had a, a dream one update where they looked at uh, PROs. Um, and I think that um, we're all looking to um, use this BCMA ADC in the hopefully the near future. We hope to have FDA approval soon. The one toxicity that has, has presented itself um, is this ocular toxicity. It can cause a keratopathy and inflammation on the surface of the eye. Um, and over half of the patients actually have to have um, uh, a dose adjustment um, uh, and a hold of their dosing due to this, this toxicity. Um, the keratopathy is actually something that can be seen by the ophthalmologist. What the patient experiences is they can sometimes experience dry eye or even blurry vision. And so what they looked at is they looked um, uh, at quality of life information from patients who receive this um, uh, agent. And what I was impressed upon is more than 70% of the patients who received this said they weren't, they weren't thinking of stopping the, the therapy because of side effects from the therapy. So I think that's just data that shows we all get nervous about ocular toxicity and you know, how patients are going to, you know, deal with the ocular toxicity and how they are fair. But I think those were data that show that actually patients are, were willing to accept that toxicity and were willing to continue therapy uh, despite having some um, incidence of ocular toxicity. Now, again, over time, uh, there has been no long-term sequelae of the ocular toxicity. And when patients come off therapy, all patients have, have had recovery of that, that, that toxicity. I think those, in general, that was the... Um, those were the abstracts that I, that I found um, most uh, important for me. Um, and I think it was a very exciting meeting. Um, I do think that the virtual meetings, they're maybe not as, not as much fun. I like the interaction with my colleagues when we're, when we're sitting in the audience and sitting together and somebody presents something and we talk about it and have quite an exchange. But we've been trying to do that on, on Twitter.